I am on. I had a great week this week, um, which I have you guys to thank for, actually, because you guys gave Bethany and I some money to get away, and we it took us a while, but we did this last week, so we were at the coast, and it was lovely, and I'm grateful for you guys, and I'm happy to come back to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to talk today about... Uh, <clears throat> about open doors, about closed doors, about God's leading uh, through a variety of means, about uh, a missionary heart that we as a church are trying to cultivate. Uh, and apparently we're doing something right because people keep leaving. So uh, <clears throat> uh, so just have that, have that, uh, have an attitude in your hearts, try and cultivate an attitude in your hearts of willingness to be led. Uh, today, and even if, it, if even if it's not like you're facing a yes or no decision right now that you've got to make by tomorrow or something like that, you know sermons aren't always for the same day they're preached on. This is something that you hide in your heart uh, to to you know save, but you will need this sermon eventually. Um, so have yeah, please just. Be relying on the Holy Spirit. Be eager to listen to hear what He has to say to His church. And um, let's, let's be sensitive to him today as we look in Acts chapter 16. You can turn there in your Bibles. We'll be in Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 8. I will uh, read it and then I'll pray and then we'll study and then I'll show you a map, which is great because maps are fun. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Oh, Lord, give us us a word that we need to hear. Um, Please remove any distractions or obstacles uh, that that are in between us and and this message that we need to hear, that we need to internalize, that we need to obey. I pray that we as a church would be hearing you as one body, but also that each individual person here would hear exactly what you need to speak to them today. Uh, we know your word is living and active, and so we just give uh, full reign to your word to have its way. Um, Holy Spirit, be our teacher and, and lead us to a place where we have a, a fuller understanding of God and his glory and, and a fuller appreciation of Christ and him crucified. Give us hearts uh, of, uh, and minds that are, that are curious to see what you have for us today, uh, but also uh, hearts and, and minds that are, that are aching to obey uh, so that we can just have that, that strong desire to become like Jesus and to walk in the way of Jesus and to bring Jesus to people. Uh, we pray that that would be our heart um, that we share with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, In verse 6, we have uh, sort of a confusing and profound statement about the work of the Holy Spirit, um, as well as some geography that will be helpful for us just understanding going forward, some of the practical things that are happening in this text. Well, (coughs) excuse me, I might have to do that a lot. Uh, I'll do it right in the microphone every time. Uh, We'll look at the the geography part uh, first. There are three places listed in verse 6, Phrygia, Galatia, and Asia. And then there's two more places in verse 7, Mycenae and Bithynia. And then we'll, in verse 8, we see Troas. All of these places are in what is now Turkey. And I'm going to give you a geography class right now so you'll be able to impress your friends and be just, you know, entertainment at dinner parties. So there's a map. You can find lots of maps like this, just in better ones even. Just Google, search any of these words, and something will show up. Google images. Uh, but this will work fine for our purposes. Galatia... There, I didn't, you know, there's no borders around any of these because they differ from which map you look at, actually. They seem to be kind of fluid. But Galatia was a region, not a city. More like a, a county region, even, or a state, a small state. 
Um, and that's the same for Phrygia, Bithynia, and Mycia. These aren't cities so much as they are regions that uh, contain cities. Paul and Silas and now Timothy, their, their teenage apprentice, they went through Phrygia and Galatia. They were going around central Turkey. Um, and as we see in verse 6, they, they can't go into Asia. Uh, when we think of Asia, we think of like China. China's not in Turkey, never has been. So it's a completely different Asia we're talking about. Um, this is talking about a region of Asia Minor. And um, uh, the, in, in Asia, for in this verse, it's, it's the extreme west of what is modern-day Turkey. And it stretches up almost to where you see the word Troas there, which is in, in smaller type. Troas actually is a city, and we'll mention that in a second. They can't go into Asia. So we can... So they come up to Mycia right there, and then they try to go into Bithynia, but they can't go there either. So they backtrack again and end up at Troas, which was not a region, but a city by the sea with a port. And it is here that they receive the call to go to Macedonia, which includes the north of Greece and a whole big area over, over there that includes the modern country Macedonia. That's actually a country now, but also uh, a large section of Greece itself. Uh, so they go down, they're stopped, they try to go up, they're stopped, they head towards the middle, and that's when they receive a word from God about direction. Already there might be some personal application that the Holy Spirit is working in your hearts about balance, but I'll let him do that by himself. So now you, you kind of see what's going on with Paul and his team on the map. So now we've got to look at what's going on in their hearts. Paul, Timothy, and Silas are sold out for the gospel. We see that uh, through their actions and through their words. They love the churches. They love the lost. Um, they've showed their love for the churches by visiting the churches all over Galatia and Phrygia and all the parts where there aren't words on that map. Um, they've delivered the letter from Jerusalem that we read in chapter 15. And, and we can be sure that they have been blessed by their fellowship with these families of believers. And we can be sure that the churches in these areas were strengthened and growing, just like we... Uh, the churches were described for us in the last verse of chapter 15. That's what we read of the churches they were visiting. They were strengthened and growing. Um, everything is great. And Paul and Silas, they could probably go home to their, their home church in Antioch knowing that they had accomplished what they had set out to do. It was a good mission trip. They were blessed. Everyone was blessed. It was wonderful. But we also know that there was an urge in Paul's heart, a compulsion that drove him into new territories with the gospel. In Romans chapter 15, verse 20, Paul writes, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Uh, in the old King James, it says, I have strived to preach the gospel. In the ESV, it says, I have made it my ambition to preach the gospel, to strive for something that's like a dog pulling on the leash because it knows it needs to get the squirrel, okay? That's striving for something. Uh, when we talk about ambition, we think of that single-minded vision that someone has when they, they've got the goal that they're working towards. Nothing is going to distract them. They're just go, go, go. Paul set his eye on the unreached people of the world, the unreached parts of the world, where no one had heard of the resurrected, of any resurrected Savior. He would look at nothing else. He was like a dog pulling on the leash to get there and bring them the gospel. This was his missionary's heart. And I pray that each of us would share this kind of ambition for doing the work of the kingdom of God, to do what you've been called to do for the kingdom of God. Paul was greedy for souls. He was passionate for the lost. And this was not at the expense of the churches he planted. It was for them. The church was blessed when the church, the church is blessed when the church grows and reaches and sends. So he's getting ready to leave the churches that he's been visiting. And he's going to go out into the great unknown the places where the gospel had not been, re been presented yet. <coughs> Excuse me. And Paul had been on this trip of encouragement. I've said this every week, but I'll say it again. That trip of, that kind of trip 
is extremely important and often neglected. Simply visiting other churches and other Christians that you are connected to is important. Even if you don't go to teach the Bible or build an orphanage or do street evangelism, fellowship is actually one of the four pillars of the early church. And it holds up the roof so that you can do everything else. Okay? In Acts 2.42, we see that the, the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and prayers and the breaking of bread. Um, we've done all four of those things today, and we get more because it's potluck. Um, this trip was mostly about the first two. They were setting doctrine right and then having fellowship. That was the whole point. And this trip that Paul just went on, it was great. It was important, it was necessary, but for him, for Paul specifically, it was not his only ministry and it was not his primary ministry. He is, at his heart of hearts, an apostle, which is one who has been sent in the footsteps of Jesus to seek and save that which is lost. He has an insatiable drive to go preach to someone who's never heard the gospel before. And when we see in verse 6 that the missionary team was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, we can safely assume that they were trying to go to Asia. They wanted to go to Asia. That region of Asia where they're talking about, as you can see on your map, it's the westernmost part of Turkey. And I think that the reason they would have wanted to go into this region is so that they could get to Ephesus. Ephesus was a hugely influential city, influential uh, culturally, politically, socially. It was a center of commerce and culture, and that really just fits Paul's style. He goes to where the people are. And, you know, we do know that once he finally does make it into Ephesus, it's an, it's an important part of his ministry. Uh, we know that God would eventually bless the ministry and the church in Ephesus. And we know, that, like I said, that Paul usually goes to where the people are in Ephesus is well populated. It would have made sense, having preached in all the other cities in, in Asia Minor, to go to Ephesus to preach. But the Holy Spirit says no, even though it makes sense. It says don't go there. And here's where we have to ask a few questions. The first of which is, how did the Holy Spirit forbid them to go? Like, how, how, what did that look like? <laughs> I mean, when God talks, what, what is that like? And here's where I, I answer emphatically and dogmatically, I don't know. Um, I have no idea. You know, when, when we were in chapter 15, we were looking at the letter sent by the apostles. And we read in chapter 15, verse 28, that the apostles wrote, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And we asked the same question. Well, how did they know? What did that look like? Um, but here's the thing. The mechanics don't matter. Or at, at least they're not the main point. We don't know what it was like. Did he speak in a still small voice like, like to Elijah in 1 Kings 19? Did he speak to them in a dream like he's about to uh, in our story in Acts 16 or a vision? Um, or, or was it an Old Testament scripture that just jumped out of the members of the team and they saw that, that it applied to their current situation? I don't know. It could have been any of those things. But the thing is, because he could have spoken in any of those ways, we see that the important thing is that he did speak in one of those ways. The Holy Spirit made his will known to them. So the team, not just one member on the team, that they were like blindly following, the team knew what God required of them. And they all knew, we can't go there. God doesn't want us to go there, not now. The answer is no, for now. Now he did this to the church corporately at the Council of Jerusalem in chapter 15. He's doing it here with this small missionary team. He's going to do it for Paul personally, in a vision of the night. The important thing is that he does this. <clears throat> the important thing is not how necessarily, but that he does. The Holy Spirit speaks. He has a will. He has a plan. It's better than yours. And he can tell you what his plan is. And let's not forget the other side of things and, and what we actually see in this story. The Holy Spirit can tell you what isn't his plan. He can tell you, don't go there. Um, let's just make this crystal clear right now. As Christians, as the church of Jesus Christ, we absolutely believe that God speaks to people and gives them guidance. Now, we don't believe he is obligated to. We, we believe that he can, and we believe that he does, 
um, we know that God speaks. For those of you that were with us when we were studying through Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, it begins, you know, in, in various times and in various means, God has spoken. And we spent a long time talking about just that miracle in itself. God has spoken. God has spoken through prophets, and in these last days, he's spoken to us in the language of his son, Jesus Christ. Um, we believe that God speaks. This should be uh, an encouraging thing to hear, uh, but quite honestly, it's not always. Um, because for some of you, and probably for all of you at some stage in your life, there's the faith that says, yeah, I know that he can do that, so why doesn't he already just tell me what to do? <laughs> it can be, this should be an encouraging thing to hear, and it should be an encouraging thing to believe, and even a no-brainer for us. You know, we have the Bible, we've, we've, we're in church, you have wise counselors that you know. We should be all, of course God speaks. But, but sometimes it can be disheartening to desire this kind of guidance and then feel like you're not getting any answers. Now, I, I believe that God speaks. I also believe that there's a huge variety in his methods, just like we don't see Jesus heal in the same way twice. Like, you know, one time he'll say a word, one time he'll lay hands on you, and the other time he'll spit in your eye. You know, like huge variety there. Um, in the same way, I, I know that God uses a variety of ways to get his point across to his people. And sometimes it's even in just kind of a shake of the head, like, no. That's enough leading. If you can sense that from the Holy Spirit of don't go there, that's leading. Um, we believe that God speaks, but some of you may believe uh, that he doesn't. Uh, and for the person who doesn't think that God wants to talk to you or doesn't need to talk to you or perhaps you just think that God doesn't have much an, of an opinion about what you do with your life, I'd encourage you to think again. Um, if he has prepared good works for you to walk in, as Ephesians 2 says that he has from before the foundation of the world, then you know he's got a plan. And if you think you're always going to find those good works all on your own without his leading, then I'm surprised your pride fit through the front doors, okay? Because you're not. Even the Apostle Paul tried things, and God said no. In fact, multiple times. And God, Paul asked for things, and God says no. And the important thing is that Paul heard him. The important thing is Paul tried, I think. Listen. Listen and expect God to communicate to you through his word, through his church, or perhaps through some other means, maybe even ones you're not entirely comfortable with. I believe God speaks. Uh, I believe that I'm obligated to believe that God speaks. Otherwise, a lot of my life doesn't make sense. <laughs> but I also know that in his infinite wisdom, he also knows when to be silent and when to lead with silence. And I know that the silence of God can be a struggle for some of us to work through. Um, so to the person who does believe that God can guide, but doesn't, maybe you don't see it in your own life, then I'd say the same thing to the, to the other skeptic. Listen, listen up. I know you think that you are listening, and maybe you are, but I'll say it anyway. Listen and expect him to lead. Uh, do you have faith that he will lead you? The word is living and active. We believe that, right? And the more you read the Bible, the more you realize that it's reading you. So start there. Get into that habit. Get into a Bible reading rut. I know that we talk about ruts like they're bad things, but I want you to be so stuck in a rut of Bible reading that you can't not read your Bible. Um, but also be open to the Spirit speaking to you through other people and other means that you may not have considered. Remember, God can and has spoken through livestock. Okay? It means that He can speak to you through extraordinary means. Now, usually that means you haven't been listening to the ordinary means that He speaks through, but He can. 
Let's look at some more practical pointers on hearing the voice of God that we can see from this story. Because I know in this story, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they are wanting to, to be guided by God. They're wanting to hear from him. So in verse, uh, verse 6, which we, uh, do we read verse 6? We read verse 6. And verse 7, and it says again in verse 7 that they were for, forbidden by the Holy Spirit. And in verse 7 it says, the Spirit did not permit them and I mentioned that this, this uh, guidance was corporate. And it's true that the dream, the vision of the night that would come to Paul, it's not a dream actually. I keep making that mistake. It's not a dream. It's a vision. Um, you know, that, that would come to Paul individually. And sometimes a team needs to be led by the leader. But the point here is that there was unity in the people who were seeking the Lord. And it's important that if you believe the Lord is speaking to you, to find other people to join with you in prayer, to seek the Lord and to listen and to seek him until you have confirmation. The Bible speaks of two or three witnesses speaking uh, in order to confirm a truth. And we must never think that we're the only ones that God can tell something to. The Holy Spirit spoke to the, the team to them, not just him, to them. And he could have spoken to one of them first and then through the one's report of what he sensed the Spirit was telling them, the others could have uh, confirmed it and said, yes, I see God working that same truth in my life. I don't know. But whatever happened, there was a consensus and a unity that, and we should seek this if we are seeking God's guidance. We should seek wise counsel, not just to get someone else's opinion, but to see that God is leading you in, in the light that he's leading you with other people and that other people are are confirming that, yes, God is sending you in this direction. Another practical point that we see is that this team is not sitting still. And there's a fine balance here and it's tricky and I don't know if I'm going to explain the balance well in this sermon, but we'll find out. Um, When they can't go further into Asia and they just sense that, that head shake of the Holy Spirit, no. Then they go up to Mycenae. It never says that the Holy Spirit told them to go to Mycenae. But it looked like an open door and they weren't going to go backwards. So they were going to go through kind of the only direction they haven't tried yet. Um, That's okay. If something looked like an open door and they walked through it, that's fine. That's not recklessness necessarily. They try to go to Bithynia, but again, the Lord speaks to them as a team corporately and says that's not his plan for them. So what do they do? They go to Troas because they saw God right in the sky and say, Troas, that away. You know, no, they just, they just go there because they had seen closed doors and open doors and you can't walk through the closed ones. So they went. And, and like I said, there's a, there's a balance here that's difficult to strike because there is a time, there's a needed time for stillness and there's a time for movement. It sounded like Ecclesiastes. Now, I believe God often calls his people to calm down, slow down, and rest in him. And I think we rarely hear or heed that call. We are so prone to busyness and stress and activity and we make excuses for these things when, uh, you know, so often they're just the works of the flesh proving our own inability to accept grace. But we're like that. We do that. And sometimes we need to stop. But God never wants us to stop to grow stagnant or stop just to, you know, die. We're never stopped for good. (coughs) In Paul... Uh, we're actually going to see a hint of this balance between activity and rest that is healthy because the stillness provides the training ground to prepare us for the next move because while sometimes we need to stop, it's always right before we need to go. And what I like about Paul's missionary team here is that they didn't stay stopped. They saw a red light and then they took a detour. And they could do that because they were completely convinced in their mission, which was to bring the gospel to people. And for the person here who wants to hear from God and they want to receive guidance, do seek him in prayer, do seek him in quiet times, in stillness, 
Uh, seek him in his word. Seek him in godly counsel. Not just good advice from someone unrelated to you, but someone who can join with you in seeking his will for you. But then, as you are filled with the knowledge of God, gained from the study of his word and the spirit who lives in your heart, get up and do something and see if it works. And, and I know this can sound conflicting. It can sound kind of reckless, maybe. Uh, you know, do I sit down and listen or get up and go? Yeah, just do, do those things. Yes. Yeah. You know, rest in the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and then go do something. Um, you know, I was, I was talking with someone yesterday, a, a friend of mine, uh, who's been in, a, you know, a variety of different church backgrounds. You know, he's, he's spent time in Calvary chapels when he was younger and he's been part of other non-denominational, part of Presbyterian churches and everything like that. And he was saying what he, uh, the one of the churches that he had been to, they had, uh, he said every, every type of like entrepreneurial ministry would just get killed in committee after committee after committee. And he was saying it in kind of tongue in cheek, you know, he's just like, yeah, you can't start anything because we'll figure out a way to have a meeting and cancel it. And he was saying that like, you know, it, he, he misses the time that he spent in Calvary Chapel because in his Calvary Chapel that he went to in uh, Orange County, and, and it's very similar with ours. If someone says they have an idea and they want to go do it, usually everyone says, cool, go try. It might not work, but that's okay. So what? A lot of stuff doesn't work. Go do it anyway. And then some stuff sticks. The good stuff sticks. And I like that. And I, I see that kind of in, in Paul's ministry where he's like, I'm just going to try and go this way. Like their trip to Asia was a dud. They weren't even able to go across the border. And their trip to Bithynia was a bunch of wasted time, resources, and money. You know, and a huge stress stressor. But, you know, they, they went and tried. And that's okay. That's okay with me. Uh, go try stuff. Go do something. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're walking down a hallway, checking doors until they find one that's unlocked. And knocking on locked doors isn't wasted time. It's God now that's going to show them which door is unlocked. And he's going to do that in a vision given to Paul. Um, we should read more Bible. Uh, let's actually go from verse 7, and then we'll read through verse 9. Um, no, we'll read all the way through verse 10. It says, After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. That's the port city, and they don't know why they're there. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, this is a really cool story in Paul's life. There's a lot here that's uh, written. There's a lot in between the lines, and there's a couple of things that are just kind of hinted at that are interesting too. Um, it says that Paul had a vision in the night. Dreams are not the same thing as visions. They are two different things. Um, we all have dreams. Dreams happen when you're asleep, and sometimes they're weird. They rarely mean anything, okay? Uh, dreams can come from God or pizza, uh, just like happiness, actually, I guess. Um, no, okay, so through, throughout Scripture, God does speak to people in dreams. God gives dreams, and the person who dreamed the dream knew that that was not a pizza dream, Okay, that was something special. Uh, Jacob, he has the dream of the stairway to heaven. Okay, he had it way before the song. Uh, Pharaoh dreams of seven fat cows, seven thin cows, seven heads of grain, uh, seven other heads of grain. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he had this dream of this big tall statue that gets bowled over by a rock. Uh, the Magi have a dream, go home a different way. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' father, excuse me, Joseph, you know, has the dream, hey, go home, it's safe now. You can go home from Egypt. These are all dreams and they happen when you're asleep, just like the dreams you have every night. Uh, visions can happen when you're awake. Okay? Uh, the prophets in the Old Testament, they received visions during their time of prayer um, and seeking the Lord. And God often would show them weird things and say, what do you see? 
And they'd say what they'd, they'd see, and God says that's exactly right, and this is what it means. So they give them uh, visions. Ezekiel sees a vision of a valley of dry bones coming to life. Uh, Zechariah has a vision of a woman put in a basket with a big heavy lid on top, and then it carries away, it's carried away to Babylon. And he had to ask about that one, because he's like, what, what, what? Uh, Peter has a, has a vision of the animals, unclean and clean animals being let down from heaven in, in, in a sheet in Acts chapter 11. And when we read of these people getting visions, they are awake. Um, verse 9 says that Paul had a vision in the night. Now, if we are to understand visions as, as we've seen them earlier in Scripture, that means that Paul was awake at night instead of sleeping at night. And I know this is kind of, maybe just reading between the lines, the vision could have woken Paul from his sleep, but that doesn't seem likely when a dream would have accomplished the same objective. Paul was awake. And I know, again, this is implied rather than explicitly expressed, but I believe that Paul received this vision as he was seeking the Lord in, in prayer in the watches of the night. He was trading sleep for prayer after successive closed doors, after God said no, 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 but he still had this burning in his heart that I have to go and preach, God, what are you doing? Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lists the trials and the tribulations that he had suffered, and he includes sleepless nights. He says, of sleepless nights often. There's many nights that I went without sleep. And he puts that right along with his beatings and shipwrecks. And Paul would have been familiar with Psalm 119. 148 through 9 says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. He would have known Psalm 63, where David says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate, you, meditate on you in the watches of the night. And I think we see here that balance of the life of Paul between sitting and waiting, seeking the Lord, and getting up and getting things done. You know, Jesus said, work while it's day. And he, he said that metaphorically. But we see also that Jesus habitually rose up early to pray before light. And occasionally he would go all through the night in prayer. Paul was praying in the night, seeking the Lord. And whether he was fasting or not, we don't know, but this is kind of like fasting. You know, this kind of watching is similar to fasting. Well, fasting is praying when you could be eating. Praying in the night is praying when you could be sleeping. And Paul was seeking the Lord. He was trying all the doors. He was crying for help, knowing that everything he's trying is a door that's slammed in his face. Thank God, well, then where do I go? And you can and should do both of these things, trying the doors and seeking the Lord hard. You know, should I slow down and pray or get up and go? Yeah, do both. You know, whenever I talk about balance, I talk about the balance of extremes. It's not the middle ground. Christianity is not moderation. It's just not. Okay? And the guy in the tightrope needs a long pole with weights on both ends to keep his balance. Okay? Jesus would go, you know, he fasted for 40 days. That's pretty extreme. But when he's in the city, people uh, uh, were able to accuse him of being a glutton and a drunkard because he knew how to party too. Not in a bad way. But he was okay eating and, and, and being with friends. You know, he had a balance of extremes. Paul has a balance of extremes. Does he seek the Lord? Yes with everything he's got. And then he gets up and he goes and tries things with everything he's got. Do both. Um, this is, you know, the, the choice between slowing down and waiting on the Lord or trying to serve the Lord. That's, that's a multiple choice test and there's two possible answers and they're both right. Okay? Check both of them. And... God leads you through closed doors. He does often to many people in Scripture. But you won't know if it's closed unless you try the knob. God also leads through a still small voice. A, uh, he can lead through a, just a, a peace that passes understanding after letting your request be made known to him. He, he can lead through a word fitly spoken through a multitude of counselors. And for uh, you know, most of those things, you have to be still and you have to be listening. So do both. 
God was leading Paul through closed doors, but he was also leading him in the night when it's quiet. And he was leading him through the miraculous, which came in response to Paul's waiting on him. I believe that. Paul receives a vision of a man from Macedonia. Um, I don't know if he was like waving a Macedonian flag or had like a name tag or something. I, Hi, I'm from Macedonia. You know, I don't know. Um, but Paul knew by what he saw or by what he sensed in his spirit that this man was from Macedonia. Macedonia on the map, uh, it's just right across the water from Troas. It's not that far to sail. And, and of course, you can see why if God wanted them to go to Macedonia, he led them by closed door after closed door to Troas, where they would be able to just catch the next ship in the morning and go to Macedonia. God leads by closed doors, and I guarantee you that you want to be where he's leading you. This Macedonian man pleads for Paul, pleads with Paul for help. Um, He is asking to be rescued, and I wish that we could all see a vision like this. Um... I wish each of us could have someone plead with us to give them the gospel so that we could see how rich this treasure is that we're holding and how vital it is to give it away. You know, Paul, Paul didn't encounter many people like this in, in real life. You know, we don't read of all these stories of people coming up to Paul and saying, hey, I heard you have a gospel. You got a spare one? You know, and, and you're not going to run into people either that come up to you and be like, hey, could you please preach to me? That, that's not what normally happens. Um, but we need to see people with this need regardless. We need to see people uh, as if they need our help because they do. They need the help that only Jesus can give. And you are the one who has the authority to introduce them to this Jesus. And you know, like I said, next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to start a short series on missionary biographies. And one of the missionaries that we'll cover in a few weeks is uh, Hudson Taylor, J. Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China, and he was a weird guy. Um, Most of the missionaries, just heads up, are weird in real life and in history. They're just all weird. Um, And on one of his first journeys to China, he was with another missionary agency before he had started his own, and he met a Chinese man, and he led him to the Lord, and that man was just filled with joy. He was just so happy. And he, he was thrilled to know that he, could, that he could know his maker and have his sins forgiven and have a life filled with the, the Spirit of God in him, you know? And, and it was all just too much joy to hold on to. And he, and he asks Hudson Taylor, and he asks him, how long have the people in your country known about this Jesus? And so Hudson Taylor, he's got to tell them, oh, hundreds, and hun- more than a thousand years, hundreds of years. And then the Chinese man, he says, What? Is it possible that for hundreds of years you have had the knowledge of these glad tidings in your possession and yet have only now come to preach it to us? My father sought the truth for more than 20 years and died without finding it. Why didn't you come sooner? And that had a profound and lasting effect on Hudson Taylor's life, as you can imagine. People need what you have. And there are people who, even if they won't express it in the same way, even if they don't show up in your dreams, uh, even if they don't beg you like the Macedonian man in Paul's vision, help us, they are in need of the help that you have. And Paul and his team understand that the help they could give this man would be given in the preaching of the gospel. That's how they interpret this call, as we see in verse 10. In verse 10, It says, Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord called us to preach the gospel to them. They they equated help with gospel. Uh, Which I think tells us two things. I think it tells us, first off, the greatest help that any living human can have is the gospel which forgives their sins and brings them into contact with their Savior. Absolutely, that is the help. But also, I think that the gospel needs to be presented as if it's help, and along and parallel with real help. If someone's hungry, feed them. That's okay to do. That's not in contrast with the gospel. That's parallel with the gospel. So when this man said, help us, you know, he could have been, 
He could have been hungry. He could have been thirsty. He could have been needed clothes or been in prison or all those things that Jesus says, you know, go and help my brother who's least of these. But the greatest help they could give along with those practical needs was preaching the gospel to them. Um, Once Paul receives the vision, he shares the vision with the team and and they have that all-important unity and consensus and it says immediately... We sought to go to Macedonia. And I love the, the prompt obedience, that willing, that extreme willingness, I guess, of going into this uncharted territory where there's no other churches, no other Christians. Um, but what's perhaps the most interesting part of this verse is actually grammatical. It's the change in pronouns. How many of you guys uh, noticed that? Immediately, we went in. We? Who's we? Uh... Uh, it's Luke. And we have another proof of God's guidance in closed doors. If Paul and Silas and Timothy, if they were able to go into Asia towards Ephesus, they wouldn't have come to Troas. And, you know, God probably would have blessed their ministry in Ephesus. There was a church, you know, ready to be birthed there. If they went into Bithynia, they would have gone, they wouldn't have gone to Troas. And if they hadn't have gone to Troas, we would not have the book of Acts we probably wouldn't have the Gospel of Luke either. Because it's in Troas where they becomes we. Uh, where a certain doctor, a physician, named Luke, joins their company. Luke would join them, interview them, take notes, and collect those notes into a book that we are now studying. Also, we see that going to Macedonia is not only going to, uh, into uncharted, unreached territory, it's going into an unreached continent making this trip the jump from the Middle East into Europe. The gospel goes to Europe because of this trip. Um, Western civilization is due in large part because of Paul's vision of the Macedonian man. Uh, God had bigger things for Paul. Um, We also see... You know, yeah, God had bigger things for Paul than Paul knew. We see that God's no led to a great big yes for future generations of Christians who are blessed with the book of Acts. But we see also that this would be a personal blessing for Paul. When Paul wrote Colossians, he includes a greeting from Luke, the beloved physician. Other versions say, our dear friend Luke, the doctor. Paul could have pushed through the closed doors. He could have. And, you know, I don't think God would have left him to himself. God would have been patient with him. He's patient with us when we do stupid stuff. But in being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, Paul personally gained not only a personal physician to patch him up after getting beat up wherever he goes, a personal doctor to treat him from prison to prison, but he also gained a dear friend. And I I don't think this is the first time you've heard this, but God totally knows what he's doing, guys. Seriously. Unless Paul and his team had heeded the signs that said road closed ahead, um, what would have been lost? You know, well, the the longest books in the New Testament. um, How about for, for Paul? You know, if he barged right on through and not listened to the Spirit, God might have still blessed his ministry. He might have had a successful church planning session and... West Asia Minor and Ephesus, and he, he would have had his, but he wouldn't have had his own personal doctor. Uh, that man pleading for help in Macedonia would have had to wait, perhaps at the cost of his eternity. And the closed doors, they really matter. Trying the door really matters. Seeking the Lord really matters. And, and when that door is open, trusting in the Lord really matters. Um, now, one, once again, this, this may or may not, I'm sure there's varying levels of personal application sprinkled throughout church today, right? For some of you, that's like, oh, wow, this is for tomorrow. You know, I got to pray and know whether to make that phone call or not or something. I don't know. And other you, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's no doors facing right away, but there will be. There will be closed doors. That's a fact you can count on. There will be closed doors. And I can, I can promise you that in hope because I can also promise you that there will always, always, always be for you the most important door. 
In Isaiah, it prophesies of a Messiah who would have the keys of David, who would be able to open a door that no man can shut and close doors that no man may open. Jesus Christ comes onto the scene and says, I am the door. Not only do I have the keys, but I am the door and I remain open. All you who thirst, come unto me. If anyone would come to the Father, he comes through me. I am the way. And there might be a door closed and you might bang your head on that for years. It may or may not ever open. Um, But there will always be an open door named Jesus. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're not supposed to try those other doors even until you get get right with that, that first one. <laughs> okay? You, you go through that first door and you'll find that you love all the other doors that are closed. <laughs> and you love all those other doors that are open. But first you have to walk through that door that remains open and can never be shut behind you. Jesus Christ, get right with Him. Walk in His presence. Live in His presence. Uh, you'll be grateful that you do. You'll be grateful that you did. And you'll see that a lot of these things that can, be, that can become stressful and, and, and make you anxious and maybe make you just, just get on your knees in the middle of the night and pray until God gives you a vision. Those things, you will be so thankful for those stressful times where you had to remain on your face because the whole time you were trying on doors, God was trying to get you to go through the door. And there is no ministry and no life decision, no career, no school, no relocation more important for you than going through the door that is labeled Jesus the Messiah. And he really wants you to spend time in that door, going through that door. Um, so we're going we're gonna to close. And I asked you at the beginning to try and cultivate a heart of listening, um, to, to, to be sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to you. And of course, I'm not going to pretend that I know what He's going to say to you. Uh, but now, um, be sure you've got at least that one open door to walk through when you get up and walk out of this building. Um, even if you have no idea what you're doing with your life, go through that one door. Jesus says, I am the door. Lord, we pray to you and you alone. We pray to you, God, the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and we come to you through Jesus Christ. We come to you on the merits of Jesus Christ. We come into that, into that holy of holies through a veil that is torn, which is your body, Jesus Christ, which we, we took today in communion, in, in a, a Eucharist. You are in us your flesh and your blood. And God, as we, we look at so many other things, I pray that we would still be looking at you. And as we try to do so many other things, let us do them with strength that you provide. I pray that we as a church would be sensitive, that each individual here would be sensitive to the closed doors, to the open doors, and also that each of us would be diligent to spend those times seeking your face, seeking your will to hear you. Um, in, in fasting, in prayer, in the night watches even. We are here to be led. Uh, we're here uh, to, to listen to your call to us. And we know that you speak. And we rejoice in that. And we know that you, spend, uh, you teach us in silence. And God, we say, blessed be your name. Apply this word to our lives and let our church grow because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.